Hi everybody, welcome to another one of my videos. This is again part of the Economic Basics series, but this is also a little mini-series in itself. So I'm going to be looking at over the next three videos, it's demand and supply. Why I broke them up into three videos? Because I'm looking at it from three different perspectives. Looking from a market as a whole, looking from the individual's perspective, mostly focusing on demand, and also looking at the various firms' perspectives. So all of this involves demand and supply, but it's from slightly different perspectives. And I think demand and supply is about time that I actually raised it in my economic basics series. I thought there's a number of other things I had to cover off first of all though. But anyway, we're going to get into demand and supply today. So in this first part, we're going to be looking at the market and the market as a whole. So when I talk about that, we're looking at the market for a particular good. For example, bananas. And that's not an individual seller of bananas, but that's the whole market for bananas. So we're going to just take a look at that and the sort of demand that they'll be facing. So, and also something to bear in mind as well is that we're looking at it from what we call a partial equi equilibrium perspective. So that is focused on one market and not any other market involvement either. So just focused on this, which is different to general equilibrium. We're not going to be touching on that. Well, probably not at all within this economic basis. So it's a fairly complex subject. But that's something for another video in the future. But today, and with all the, the three parts, we're going to be looking at partial equilibrium. Okay, so what we have here, first of all, is demand. Typically, your demand curve, or your demand function, is going to be downward sloping. So, if you have a very high price, there's very few people that are willing to buy it. So, you can see there you've got our monopoly man. So, this is people that have a very high value for that particular thing. And whereas you've got at the other extreme, you've got down to a price of almost zero. That is basically your entire market, or your entire demand that particular thing. In this case, we're talking about bananas. So that's everybody who desires a banana, basically, and that's at zero dollars. And as the price goes up, you have less and less people because people start dropping out. So for example, if you know, I may have a willingness to pay, we call it, for a banana, let's say one dollar. So if it's the price is one dollar ten, then I wouldn't buy it. If it's 90 cents, then I would. So what we've got here is a demand schedule. So what this looks like, so in this very simple demonstration here, so we've got to imagine if the price was $8. You can see only got one person interested. As the price starts to fall, more and more people are interested in buying this particular good. So you can see here, so if it drops to 6, the number is doubled. You drop down to 4, it's doubled, and you drop down to 2, it's doubled again. So as the price gets lower, generally more people uh, will demand that particular good. Unless it's a given good, but we'll talk about that another time. But in most cases, demand is downward sloping, and the cheaper, the lower the price, the more people are willing to buy. All right, how about supply? Supply is, tends to be the opposite to demand. It's an upward so, sloping slope, so it's, it's going upwards. And that's simply because the higher the price, the more sellers, or the more a seller is willing to sell. So, for example, you look at it in terms of cost. If the very minimum cost something can be produced is say two dollars, and the price is below that, then you're not going to get anyone selling it simply because you'll be making a loss. Well, generally you wouldn't anyway. So that's the point here. So that's where you'd have your intersect with the uh, y-axis at a certain point above zero. And as that price goes up, more and more willing to sell more and more of that item, and more and more there'd be more entrance into the market willing to sell as the price goes up. So as you get higher and higher, and also profits would tend to go up as well. Okay, so what, what we have now is what we call equilibrium. So that is the intersect. It's when your two, your demand and supply intersect. So that's what you get is your equilibrium. You get your equilibrium price and your equilibrium quantity. And that isn't always achieved immediately, but after a period of time, you come up with a price. If you're charging too high, then the price will have to go down because you don't have the demand. Or if you're charging too low, then the supplies will come in and start increasing supply. So eventually you should get to an equilibrium point. And once you've got that, you can see here, we've got something we call consumer surplus and producer surplus. So consumer surplus is all those people that were willing to pay, let's say, $8 for the bananas and the price is only $4, they're getting a consumer surplus of $4. So that is the difference between what someone is willing and able to pay and what they actually pay, the actual price being sold. 
So as you can see, the consumer surplus is getting smaller and smaller as you get closer to the equilibrium. And then once it goes below that, people would stop buying. They wouldn't be interested in buying anymore because their willingness to pay is actually lower than the price. On the other hand, you've got producer surplus. And that is the area below the line. So you can see you've got producer surplus at the x-axis where it's slowly getting smaller and smaller as you get into it. So if your cost is well below, so that's what you're willing to produce that it's selling for. So if your cost is like $2 and it's selling for $4, you'd be able to get that producer surplus of $2. And as your costs are going up and up and up, as it gets closer to that $4 mark, then that surplus disappears. And if, for example, you can only produce something at $6 and the price is $4, then you won't produce any at all. So that would be get your cutoff point. All right, so I've got another little graph here, another little table, sorry. And what we've got here is very similar to just now, but I've added in the smiley faces, and that's the consumer surplus. So you can see at a price of $8, you only have one buyer, and that person wouldn't get any consumer surplus. As it drops down to six, one of them actually has consumer surplus and one of them doesn't. And that continues as the price falls and falls and falls. So you can see your consumer surplus is getting larger and larger as your price is beginning to drop. Okay, so what happens now if there's an event, something that happens, that disrupts that equilibrium? So remember, equilibrium imbalance, so your demand and supply equal each other, but something could happen, an event could happen that causes that to change. So what I've assumed here is that we've got population growth. So what happens when you have a larger population? I think the first thing you probably think of is you get an increase in demand. So we're within the... Um, in the um, graph, we show it as a shift in the demand curve to the right. As you get more and more people, they require, so let's say every person, for example, demands two bananas. So if you double the population, then effectively you're doubling the demand. So an increase in demand would then push up your price. But saying that though, population may not necessarily, population increase may not necessarily result in an increase in price. What may actually happen is your price could actually go down. Because you've got to bear in mind there are more people, they're not just consuming, they're not just buying. There's also people that are out there that are actually joining the industry and actually producing more. So you would get an increase in supply as well. And now whether your price actually goes up or down depends on whether the increase in population is producing a greater supply than the extra demand that they require. So potentially if they don't, the price could go up or if they're producing more, then your price could actually go down. But with population growth though, you should almost certainly see a higher quantity in the market for something, almost certainly. As you can see, both the supply and demand curves are shifting out, so indicating an increase in quantity. Another thing I wanted to touch on was complements and substitutes. So like you've got with your bananas we're talking about, so you'll have something like I don't know, uh, what do you call that, a fruit blender or a juicer or something like that? The availability of juicers would actually add value to bananas because some people like to eat bananas as they are, some people might prefer them to be juiced or sliced or cut or whatever. So you've got a juicer that adds actual value to your bananas and that's something that I talked about right at the very beginning, that you actually have complementary things. Remember the, um, the shelter and rest? You have a, a shelter built actually improves utility you get out of relaxing and resting. So in this case with bananas, we've got a juicer that actually improves, it creates more demand for the banana because you get more utility out of it because you've got another way of eating it where you can actually drink it now as if it's been juiced. So that adds, and then you have a substitute, which in this case we're talking about pineapples. So bear in mind the juicer adds value, a substitute that offers alternative, it doesn't necessarily take away value from bananas, but it gives people another option. So if someone might like bananas and pineapples, so you'd eat a certain number of bananas, then you might switch over to pineapples. So instead of having four bananas, you might have just two bananas, and maybe you'll also have a pineapple, for example, instead. So that would actually have the effect of reducing your demand. So let's see what that does to our demand curve. So in the case of a juicer, you would actually see your demand curve go out because it's a complement. So people would now demand more bananas because they've got the juicer and they've got more things to do with it. So it's got more utility. If on the other hand, with the pineapples, you'd actually see a leftward shift in your demand curve. And that would be, again, because not because you've got less value out of your bananas, but there's an alternative. So for example, we talk about 
you know, I think one of the other less uh, videos, but you've got diminishing returns or diminishing utility. So your first banana may be great, second banana may not be quite so good, and third, even, you know, it starts to lose value, but then you can bring in the pineapples, which then would have more value in themselves, which may value them more, or get more utility from your diminishing returns, what you get from your bananas. But we're not gonna to cover too much on that today. Also, take note as well, when you've got a shift in your demand curve, so if you go to the right, that's more demand for bananas because of the juicer, because of the um, complementary good. You see that your price actually goes up and your quantity goes up. They actually both go up because people are willing to pay more now for those bananas because they're getting more value out of it. And there could be people switching to bananas that are really into juice. So you've got a higher price and a higher quantity. Whereas if you've got the pineapples, because it's competing with the bananas, so there's people are going to demand pineapple, uh, bananas because they can switch. So that means people are not going to be willing to pay as much money because they can go to that alternative, the pineapple. So you get a reduction in price and also you get a reduction in quantity as well. Okay, that just takes us to the end of the first part of my supply and demand series. So the next part I'm going to be looking at individuals. So this is going to link quite closely to what I talked about in one of my earlier videos in regards to um, utility. So yeah, so take note for that. That's going to be coming out fairly soon. And I hope you enjoyed this video. So I've reached the end of that. So if you would uh, like to see more videos like this, hit the um, subscribe button. And if you like this video, just hit the like button. And this series will continue. Again, there'll be more economics basics ones coming out, as well as the demand series within this, and also a few other videos relating to, again, possibly vegan economics, or cost-benefit analysis and things like that. So just stay tuned and uh, hopefully I'll see you again soon.